Lord, I commend this time back into your hands, O oh God. Jesus once said in one place, those that you have given me, I will that where I am, they will be also. I thank you, O oh God, for that word coming to pass in our lives, that where he is, so shall we. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen. The spoken word, as spoken by the prophets, and the scriptures cannot be broken. John chapter 15, starting with verse 16 through 25. You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you, that you should go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain, that whatsoever you shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it to you. These things I command you, that you love one another. If the world hate you, Know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love his own. But because ye are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. Remember the word that I said unto you, The servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept, me, if they have kept my saying, they will keep yours also. But all these things will they do unto you for my name's sake because they know not him that sent me. If I had not come and spoken unto them, they had not had sin, that they had not sinned, but now they have no cloak for their sin. He that hateth me hateth my father also. If I had not done among them the works which none other man did, they had not had sin. But now, but now they have both seen and hated, both me and my father. But this cometh to pass, that the word might be fulfilled that is written in their law, they hated, hated me, me without, a, without cause. a cause. It was written in their law. They hated me without a cause. The Holy Spirit moved the prophet of, of old to give us insight and revelation into the things that would happen and would surely come to pass. And one of the things that came to pass, we saw the reality of that word played out in the life of Jesus. And those that would follow him, that same reality is before them. In 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 20 through 21. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So, holy men of God spoke as the Holy Spirit moved them. And the scriptures cannot be broken because the man of God, the prophet of God, that is moved by the Holy Ghost is not speaking on his own fruition. He's speaking prompted by the Spirit of God. And that revelation of that prophecy uh, will, as I said before, come to pass because the scriptures cannot be broken in Psalms 35, 19 through 21. Let not them that are mine enemies wrongfully rejoice over me, neither let them wink with the eye that hate me without a cause. For they speak not peace, but they devise deceitful matters against them that are quiet in the land. Yea, they open their mouth wide against me and said, Aha, our eye hath seen it. As I said before, someone had already said that this would happen in the life of our Lord, that they would, if you will, hate him without a cause, that they would rejoice over him who wrongfully make him the enemy. They will hate me without a cause. They do not speak peace, but they devise deceitful manners against the quiet ones in the land. But this was already foretold that this would be his lot. So therefore, mm -hmm. the Lord was not surprised as the revelation of that prophecy came to pass in his life. In Psalm 69, verse 4. They that hate me without a cause are more than the hairs of my head. They that would destroy me, being my enemies wrongfully, are mighty. Then I restored that which I took not away. So here again, the, the prophets of old had already foretold, and the scripture cannot be broken. 
And we're going to see this in real time, real way, played out in the life of Christ. And also this same prophecy was played out in the lives of the people who followed Christ, that they hated them without a cause. They had no cause. They had no right. Uh, they had no reason. But nonetheless, they hated him. Psalms 109 verse 3 through 5. And hate is a very, very strong word. But scripture is clear that they hated him. And hopefully this evening we may understand to a certain degree why. Because the scriptures cannot be broken. It's a spoken word spoken by the prophets. Psalms 109, 3 through 5. They have also surrounded me with words of hatred and fought against me without a cause. In return for my love, they are my accusers, but I give myself to prayer. Thus he said, but he gives himself to prayer. I'm sure that maybe uh, someone in this audience have had that experience of someone hating you without a cause for no reason. And sometimes the more you may love on that individual or that group of people, the more they hate you. Continue. But I give myself to prayer, thus they have rewarded me evil for good and hatred for my love. Now, it's kind of hard to phantom that someone, if you will, that had the works of Christ, uh, people would actually hate on him. But uh, here again, uh, we may explore uh, this evening some reasons. In John chapter 7, verse 14 through 20. Now about the middle of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and taught. And the Jews marveled, saying, How does this man know letters, having never studied? How, how does this man know the word of God? How does this man um, uh, understand prophecy? How does this man understand the revelation of the scriptures? Having been taught, by, certainly by none of our schools, but here it is, um, he understood and could teach so much so that they marveled. Continue. Jesus answered them and said, My doctrine is not mine, but his who sent me. He said, This is not my doctrine. You, 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 I understand you can't get to God because he's invisible. And God sent me here so you could get to me, that you could vent your hate, your frustration, your disappointment, your depression on me. Continue. If anyone wills to do his will, he shall know concerning the doctrine. So if you will to do God's will, you will understand why I came and maybe the hate will start to alleviate or evaporate. Maybe, just maybe, if you understand that I came from a bosom of love, uh, I came out of a place that wanted you to put down your offenses against me. Continue. You shall know concerning the doctrine, whether it is from God or whether I speak on my own authority. He who speaks from himself seeks his own glory. So if, if I talk about myself, my own glory, my own pride, and if I speak to that, then you might have reason to reject me. But I'm speaking from someone else's glory, someone else's position, someone else's reality for me. Continue. But he who seeks the glory of the one who sent him is true, and no unrighteousness is in him. Did not Moses give you the law? Yet none of you keeps the law. Why do you seek to kill me? So he gave you the law, but you don't keep the law. So why do you seek? Why do you hate me so much? Continue. The people answered and said, you have a demon who is seeking to kill you. I, no one. So they respond to him when he says that you, you're the problem. <laughs> you know, oftentimes people will say you're the problem. No one is seeking to kill you, but he knew that they, they could finally vent this hatred out on someone who said they represented God. Because 
something inside of us want to have this audience with God. Job wanted to have it with him because he just knew that somehow or another, God got it wrong. <laughs> he got it wrong. And we feel that he got it wrong with us. In John chapter 7, verse 14 through 20. Oh, you just read that, right? Luke 22, 42 to 44. Saying, Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours. I wonder what his thought patterns was when he, who is son of man and son of God, would he, you know how just before you get ready to die, some people experience this uh, looking back over an experience of life. And I wonder what his experience looked like when he realized he had arrived at this hour. And here it is, there were people that he knew hated him. And he came from a place of love. And they wanted him dead. So he said, Lord, if it's your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, it was as if you will, a final surrender. After all the wrestling that went on in his spirit from almost the time he was born, it was the final surrender. He was right at the line of victory before you cross over. And he had one more thing to do. Let his will be given over and be, if you will, replaced with God's will for his life. Then an angel appeared to him from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. Then his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. The anxiety that beset him in that moment of time. In Romans chapter 5, verse 10. For if we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son. When we, For were, if, when we were enemies, enemies, when we were enemies, when we hated him at our zenith, and there was a dislike, maybe even bordering on hate, that was in me. When, I, when he came into my life, so many misunderstandings, not understanding that at the end of the day, it was going to be all right and it was going to make sense. But in that moment, I was his enemy. And I'm sure that if he came on the scene in the day that he came on the scene with all of these peoples and the chief elders and the Pharisees, I more than likely would have been in the crowd to say, crucify him. Continue. Or if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. We were reconciled to God by the death of his son. How much more through his life we will be reconciled. Continue. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. Thank you. In Matthew 26, verse 47 through 56. And while he was still speaking, behold, Judas, one of the twelve, with a great multitude with swords and clubs, came from the chief priests because and elders. Because the scripture cannot be broken. He had to be hated and he had to die wrongfully 
from his enemies. Continue. Came from the chief priests and elders of the people. Now his betrayer had given them a sign, saying, Whomever I kiss, he is the one. Seize him. All of this was prophesied, and the scriptures cannot be broken. It's a spoken word. Continue. Immediately he went up to Jesus and said, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. But Jesus said to him, Friend, why have you come? Then they came and laid hands on Jesus and took him. And suddenly one of those who were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword, struck the servant of the high priest, and cut off his ear. But Jesus said to him, Put your sword in its place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Or do you think that I cannot now pray to my father, and he will provide me with more than twelve legions of angels? So why did they hate him so much? It wasn't like he had a present standing army. It wasn't like he had permission from the authority of his day. To the contrary, he did not. But he had all kinds of good works, like healing people, raising the dead, encouraging people, causing them to understand there was a better and brighter day coming. But why did they hate him so much? And why were they so fearful of him? We normally are fearful of things we don't understand. Or somehow or another, something about that individual is going to change us in a way that we haven't experienced or we may not like. Continue. How then could the scriptures be fulfilled that it must happen thus? The scriptures have to be fulfilled. It was spoken of me that this would happen, that would happen, the other would happen. It was spoken of you, your reaction to me that you would resent me, not believe me, discount me, despise me without a cause, without a reason. Even people in the crowd that he may have touched turned on him. It's very difficult for us to understand when we're good to people, why do they turn on us? But if they hated him, they hate you because he gave the best and the brightest and the most awesome present. He gave us a gift, a gift of life where we were in the shadows of death. It, it boggles the mind as to why we hate him and why pockets of that resistance lies in us. Today, it depends on our circumstances that we may find ourselves in that hurt us, that are in pain, or he does something that we don't want or disappointed, and ultimately he makes the decision. Then something rises up in us that most of the time, if not all the time, if you understand what it is, there's a shame that comes over you. And you say, God, please have mercy. Because you remember our frame. You remember that we are dust. You remember that we were shaping in iniquity. Continue. In that hour, Jesus said to the multitudes, Have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs to take me? I sat daily with you, teaching in the temple, and you did not seize me. You could not take me before the time. It was prophesied that you couldn't get me. No matter what I said and how angry you are, in God's plan, there's a set time for everything under the sun. There's a time to be born and a time to die. There's a time to throw away stones and there's a time to gather up. It depends on the season of the plan of God. There's a resistance inside of us that says to God, who made you the judge over us? Who, 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 why is it that you can decide who and what I am? I'll take matters into my own hand to show you that I'm God too. Because they hated him without a call. But the scripture cannot be broken. Verse 56. But all this was done that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. 
It was all done according to the plan, according to the prophecy. So things that happened in our life have already been planned out by God. You cannot be born before the time and you cannot die before the time. Even if you try to execute your own suicide, if it's not your time, how many times and how many ways have people tried to die, but they could not? before the time because there's a sunrise and a sunset and the scriptures cannot be broken no matter what you do to manipulate even your own body it doesn't matter it's a beginning day and an end day there's a dash in between and you can do God or you can do you so the prophecy of Christ's suffering and death became for me a reality in first peter chapter one started with eight through eleven i've had a personal experience of uh, salvation based on the prophecy that was prophesied about me and god's elect continue whom having not seen you love though now you do not see him yet believing you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Of this salvation the prophets have inquired and searched carefully, who prophesied of the grace that would come to you. Th these prophets prophesied that God would allow me and those of dispens disp dispensation to have what we call a merited favor. It had never happened before <laughs> that he would wink at our ignorance and our sin and allow us to repent because of the prophecy that would come to pass that he would send his son to die on the cross for sinners. And if you don't get that, then you won't get him. <laughs> See, you won't, you won't get him if you don't get that. And so many people don't get that. And it's unfortunate because he loved the world. And he's long-suffering to us who it's not willing that any should perish, but, call, but, but all should come to repentance. But those, be, there will be people that perish because they don't get that for whatever Reason in John chapter 11, verse 49 to 52. And one of them, Caiaphas, being high priest that year, said to them, You know nothing at all, nor do you consider that it is expedient for us that one man should he die. He prophesied for the people. that there was going to be a man to die for the people, for the nation. Continue. And not that the whole nation should perish. Because if he doesn't die, the whole nation will perish. The world is without hope. Because there has to be some, someone to redeem us. Because we were with another master, another lord, another king, another god. And people don't understand that either. That there is another god. <laughs> Continue. Now this he did not say on his own authority, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation. And not, and for, not for that nation only, but also that he would gather together in one, the children of God who were scattered abroad. Ephesians 2, 13, 19. He would gather us together as one man. It was prophesied. Continue. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in his flesh the enmity that is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus one making peace. One new man from the two. So, According to prophecy, there was already a king, or if you will, God, because these two natural and 
um, supernatural entities represented God to the people. And there were two kings or gods present when Jesus came into the flesh, into this world, because he was, as Prophet Ammon said, outside the system. He came into the system out of the bosom of the Father, and he was born in our world, welcome to our world. But he was outside the system. So there was a king already in place. And this king didn't like the fact that there was people were talking about another king that was born, another God that was born, son of man, son of God. And he was determined to kill him according to the scriptures in uh, Matthew 2, 16 to 18, because Herod represented the government of that day. And already they were out to kill him. Already he was hated as a baby because Herod got a win of what this little king, if you will, represented to his kingdom. Continue. Then Herod, when he saw that he was deceived by the wise men, was exceedingly angry, and he sent forth and put to death all the male children who were in Bethlehem and in all its districts. So not only was he after, in an effort to get to Jesus, he killed every male child to and under. But it was written in the scriptures, and the scriptures cannot be broken. So Mary and Joseph and Jesus had to flee. But the other, if you will, uh, authority or king or God that uh, was threatened by the birth of Christ was, of course, the church or religion. In John chapter 9, 15, starting with verse 15. Then the Pharisees also asked him again. How Talking he about the man that was born blind uh, from a child continue how he had received his sight he said to them he put clay on my eyes and i washed and i see now these are church folk the religion of that day and they didn't know that they were serving another god they didn't understand it so believe it or not jesus was very patient with them because he knew that some of them almost all of them maybe, but there was a few of them whose eyes were going to be open because here this man, he was born blind and he set them, this man, as an example that he had a hope that their eyes would be open. Continue. Therefore, some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God because he does not keep the Sabbath. Others said, how can a man who was a sinner do such signs? And there was a division among them. They said to the blind man again, What do you say about him because he opened your eyes? He said, He is a prophet. But the Jews did not believe concerning him that he had been blind and received his sight until they called the parents of him who had received his sight. And we can go on down to verse 23. Therefore his parents said, He is of age. Ask him. So they again called the man who was blind and said to him, Give God the glory. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered and said, Whether he is a sinner or not, I do not know. One thing I know, that though I was blind, now I see. Then they said to him again, What did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I told you already, and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? So why do you hate me so much? Why did they hate him? so much he opened the eyes isn't that something to marvel at but they were in another understanding another religion and god was after something much more deeper than keeping commandments you can teach mice commandments 
if you understand, to do that. The point I'm trying to make, you can teach mice. You can teach almost the base of them animals how to keep doing something in rotation. God is not after robots. If he wanted robots, then he would have made us to be robots. He wants something living. That's why he gives us a will. So we can choose, we can use the exercise of our minds and fill it on the inside. He wants rational, intelligent beings. He doesn't want dummies, people that on a dime uh, act, uh, get into a robotic kind of, just to uh, make, make them look a certain kind of way. And so he was after them, but they were, that was the, the two kings that existed in Jesus' day that the prophets prophesied about that wanted to kill him. And the scriptures cannot be broken. Then in 2 Corinthians 4, verses 3 and 4, there was a God of this world that was already on the throne. And that's difficult for people to understand. There was already a God present on the throne when Jesus came into the world. Continue. But even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should, should shine on them. So there's the God of this world. And that's very difficult for people to get, if you will. But in Matthew 3, he shows up and has a conversation with Jesus. In Matthew 3, starting with verse 1. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea. And saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at I'm hand. I'm sorry, uh, Matthew 4. And then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be to tempted. To be tempted by who? The devil, who was the God of this world. <laughs> and he has his sergeants, corporates, lieutenants, general that work for him. They don't want not one of us to convert and believe the gospel. You are that important because they are thinking if he can get one, then he can get two, then he can get three. So they wanted to stop him in his tracks immediately. And so the devil takes him up and talks to him. And this whole chapter is about his introduction and his reaction to the God of this world, according to the scriptures that cannot be broken. In Revelations chapter 12, verse nine. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. Who, who does he deceive? the whole world and he wanted to deceive jesus that day he told jesus you bow down and everything i have would be yours and jesus said i worship god and god alone see he wanted our god to bow down to his godship and our god said it's not going to happen 1 John chapter 5, 19. We know that we are of God, and the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. The whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. And that was the kingdom that was in place when Jesus came on the scene. But he, it was prophesied by the prophets that he would die to ransom us from that kingdom to his kingdom, that we would be conveyed from the kingdom of darkness and to the kingdom of his dear son. It was prophesied about me. It was prophesied about you. And, and it also was prophesied that he was the lamb of God, that the lamb would have to be crucified. In John chapter 1, verse 29, and the scriptures cannot be broken because it is a spoken word. It is a living word. 
The next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Isaiah 53, verse 1 through 7, it was prophesied who has believed our report that thus the Son would come being declaring the will of the Father and die for you and me, be led like a, a, a sheep to slaughter, that in himself he bore our sicknesses. In himself, he bore our sins, and by his stripes, we are made whole. We are finally on a path of healing. And I'm not healed altogether as I speak before you, but trust me, the process has begun. So much so that even in the inwards of my heart and our mind, he has to dig deep to get the residue of hate out. And it takes a minute because I was born and shaped in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. But now I'm in him as he does the work on the inside of me, on the inside of me to borrow deep and numb the pain in the process. It's a process well going through. The natural and the spiritual will resist our attempts to make Jesus our king. Both systems will hate you. The natural kingdom will hate you as well as the spiritual gate. The God of this world hates us because he doesn't want to lose us. And when we leave his kingdom, he makes our lives miserable. But great is he that's in us than he that is in the world. In Matthew 17, verse 23. And they will kill him, and the third day he will be raised up. They will kill him. It was prophesied that they would kill him. In Matthew 23, verse 34 to 39. Therefore, indeed, I send you prophets, wise men, and scribes. Some of them you will kill and crucify. And some of them you will scourge in your synagogue. We reject what won't, that we fear, that we don't want to change. We reject because we don't want him to rule over us nor judge us. They rejected Moses. They didn't want him to rule over him. And he wound up not going over into the promised land. Because they didn't even want him, even after all the things that were done by and through his hand. They still hated him. And there's something inside of us that don't want God to rule. And when we don't want God to rule, we wound up ruling over ourselves. And what a mess. What a mess. When our children don't obey us. What a mess when we don't obey the authority over us. What a mess when we don't obey God. As if he hates us. We hate him. And he teaches us through the awesomeness. Because God never did this before. As Prophet Aaron shared with us. The gods of the Old Testament never displayed this kind of love. That he would die in our place. People destined to die because of disobedience. Continue. And some of them you will scourge in your synagogues and persecute from city to city. That on you may come all the righteous blood shed on the earth. From the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. So he said, look at all the people you killed 
because of your disobedience, because of your rebellion, because of your hate. But it was written that you would do it. It was written that we would execute people that we don't understand, that we think we're better than. It's a terrible, terrible um, acknowledgement, but it's a true acknowledgement. And God desires truth in the inward part, that we have to tell ourselves the truth about ourselves, who we really are, when we stand before God. Because when the Pharisee, when the churchgoer goes before God and says to God, I'm righteous and I'm good, the Bible says he resists that person and he gives grace to the person that beats their chest and know the only reason why God hasn't killed them yet is because He's who he is. He's a strong God. He's an awesome God. A weak God seeks to kill you because he cannot stand that you threaten his power because God is a strong God. He's an awesome God. He is not afraid or intimidated when we rebel against him because he is love. He knows when it's over. He knows when you will not turn. And only God knows that. And the man or woman of God that he gives a spoken word to. When they're moved by the Holy Ghost. So he knows what's in them. So he says in verse 37, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gather her chick, chicks under her wings. But you were not willing. You would not yield. You would not acknowledge that I am God, the creator, and you are the creature that was made, that was formed from the dust. Wow. In Matthew 26, verse 1 through 4. Now it came to pass, when Jesus had finished all these sayings, that he said to his disciples, You know that after two days is the Passover, and the Son of Man will be delivered up to be crucified. It wasn't lost on him. He already knew, because he knew the spoken word given by the prophets. He saw himself in the word, and he knew it was him, because it was a true word. And we should know when we're reading this, these scriptures, whether, if you will, they jump out on you because the scriptures jumped out on me one day, not just one day. It jumps out to me often in my walk. And I know that that word that's on page it, on this page is a spoken word for my life and the scripture cannot be broken. He said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. That I had promised you eternal life. And I believe him because of the scriptures. John 5, 8 through 18. Jesus said to him, rise, take up your bed and walk. And immediately the man was made well, took up his bed and walked. And that day was the Sabbath. The Jews therefore said to him, who was cured, It is the Sabbath. It is not lawful for you to carry your bed. He answered them, He who made me well said to me, Take up your bed and walk. Then they asked him, Who is the man who said to you, Take up your bed and walk? But the one who was healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had withdrawn, a multitude being in that place. Afterward Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, See, you have been made well. Sin no more lest a worse thing come upon you. The man departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. 
For this reason, the Jews persecuted Jesus and sought to kill him because he had done these things on the Sabbath. See, and that's what religion does. Religion is a foundation for children. Right, wrong, do this, don't do that. It's a schoolmaster, but it should lead us to a living relationship with a living God. So as he says to him, they persecuted him and they hated the thought to kill him because he was going to destroy their religion, their front, their pretense. Because people that are religion, religious generally don't have a relationship with God. It's not living it's not because God walks with us daily. The Bible said Enoch walked with God and he was not because God took him. And so we have a daily, morning by morning, he waketh our ear to hear us to learn it. We have a daily, continual walk with God where he's speaking to us. And believe it or not, we're speaking back to him. We're in a relationship. We're talking. We're just not quoting it's real, and it's a living relationship. And when you, when people perceive that you have a living, real relationship with God, they hate you. It's, it's, it's an amazing thing. They don't care about you being religious because a relationship convicts them of sin, righteousness, and judgment. That God is actually real. <laughs> I mean, he's real. And when people stand for the cause of Christ, even if their own lives are jeopardized, it's, a, it's real that someone would die for the cause of Christ. So throughout Christian history, so many missionary and men and women of God from all races and all colors have stand in the gap, willing to give up their life for the cause of Christ, willing to side with the minority and not be with the majority, willing to walk a narrow walk and not be in the broad way. They will hate you for it because it's not predictable <laughs> and it's real and it's tangible and it's worth fighting for. And all worth dying for. In John chapter 7, verse 1. After these things, Jesus walked in Galilee, for he did, he did not want to walk in Judea because the Jews sought to kill him. Because they sought to kill him. Verse 14, same chapter. Now about the middle of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and taught. And the Jews marveled, saying, How does this man know letters, having never studied? Jesus answered them and said, My doctrine is not mine, but his who sent me. His who have sent me. So there is a, and it's not a doctrine where you're carrying your Bible. It's a doctrine of living a life. And people know when you're authentic. They know it. They feel it. It's real. That doesn't mean that you don't have problems or issues and those kinds of things. But they know when the love is real. The love that you have for God is real. In John chapter 8, verse 37 through 41. I know that you are Abraham's descendants, but you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. So you are Abraham's descendants and you pride yourself on being attached to someone that in scripture, we revere in a certain light. And there's a pride that comes when we uh, associate with people who we think uh, are revered, both uh, spiritually and naturally. Uh, it can be happen with uh, uh, prophets, pastors, priests. So we like to align ourselves with people that project a holiness that we may or may not have, but it makes us feel like we're closer to God in some way. Continue. 
I speak what I have seen with my father, and you do what you have seen with your father. So they never even, when he started talking along this way, they didn't understand they were serving another God when they seek to kill this God. <laughs> they, it, didn't, it didn't register. So he had to come right out and tell them. You are serving another God. In verse 44, you are of your father, the devil, and the desires of the father, of that father, your father, you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there's no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father thereof. This is the same devil that took Jesus up into a high mountain and showed them all the kingdom of the world. He is no slouch. But Jesus knew it from the beginning, and he knew ultimately. His fight was not with them, but with him, the enemy, the devil. So our fight is not with people because we do not wrestle with flesh and blood, but we wrestle against principalities and the powers and the rulers of the doctors of this world. We, we wrestle with the princes of darkness. And Jesus had this wrestling bout with the enemy every day. But the prophet said that he would die as the Lamb of God in order to ransom us back. In Matthew 27, starting with verse 1. When morning came, all the chief priests and elders of the people plotted against Jesus to put him they to death. They said all of them plotted against Jesus according to the scriptures. Continue. And when they had bound him, they led him away and delivered him to Pontius Pilate, the governor. Then Judas, his betrayer, seeing that he had been condemned, was remorseful and brought back the thirty pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. And they said, What is that to us? It was already prophesied that he would do this, but he could not be saved. Because the scripture cannot be broken. So when God speaks a word through prophecy over us, and it's a good word, you better shout. Because there are some people that were doomed by the prophecy from the beginning. And I know what you say, well, that's not fair. You up in this business now, okay? All I'm saying, you up in God's business. That's his plan. You were God, if you are God, and, and you can be God in a little tiny way, can you just govern your own life? And you can show us then that you're God and you all good and you do things right. But I can already see the mess we make of our lives being God. So we're all up in that now, trying to figure out why did he do that and all of that. That's none of our affair. Our minds are too even teeny to comprehend this God that we serve. So here it is. It was too little, too late. It was already prophesied. The scripture cannot be broken. Move on. What is that to us? You see to it. Then he threw down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. But the chief priest took the silver pieces and said, It is not lawful to put them into the treasury because they are the price of blood. This is dirty money. We can't put it in. <laughs> I mean, see, see the hip hop. Now he is, you can make kill God and you're concerned that <laughs> or attempt to kill God and you're concerned about the money. That that was is was purchased and you purchased blood. He did your bidding. Continue. And they consulted together and bought with them the potter's field to bury strangers in. Therefore, that field has been called the field of blood to this day. 
Then was fulfilled what was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet, saying, And they took the thirty pieces of silver, the value of him who was priced, whom they of the children of Israel priced, and gave them for the potter's field, as the Lord directed me. Now Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, saying, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said to him, It is as you say. And while he was being accused by the chief priests and elders, he answered nothing. Then Pilate said to him, Do you not hear how many things they testify against you? But he answered him not one word, so that the governor marveled greatly. That he was led to, as a sheep to the slaughter, yet he did not open his mouth. It was a spoken word. It was a word spoken by a prophet, and the scripture cannot be broken. Continue. Now at the feast, the governor was accustomed to releasing to the multitude one prisoner whom they wished. And at that time, they had a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. Therefore, when they had gathered together, Pilate said, to, Pilate said to them, Whom do you want me to release to you, Barabbas or Jesus, who was called Christ? For he knew that they had handed him over because of envy. That they had handed him over because of envy, or because of covetousness, because they had a grudge, because of hatred, jealousy, malice, resentment. The reason sometimes we hand someone over, the reason why we mistreat people, the reason why. We do the things we do. It's for a reason, wanting something someone else has. And so we will slay the innocent to feast in our flesh over the things that they have. Continue. While he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent to him, saying, have nothing to do with that just man, for I have suffered many things today in a dream because of him. So, who in the world sent her that dream to tell him that? Don't have anything to do with it, she warned him. This is a just man. And I've had a dream because of him, but the chief priests and elders persuaded the multitudes that they should ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor, governor answered and said to them, which of the two do you want me to release to you? They said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, what then shall I do with Jesus who is called the Christ? They all said to him, let him be crucified. Then the governor said, why? Why do you hate him so much? What has he done? What is his cause? But they prophesied in the scripture. They hated him without a cause. So it had to happen. Because in Isaiah 53, it says, it pleased the Father to bruise him, to make his life an offering. Yet it pleased, in verse 10, yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. That's me. He shall prolong his days. And the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify many. For he should bear their iniquity. They hated him without a cause. And he had to die. But I am thankful to God on this day. His death caused me to be made alive. So I can sit before you and thank God for the spoken word that came through the prophets for my life as well as yours. In the mighty name of Jesus. So, Father, I thank you, I honor you, I bless you. 
Lord, your goodness and your love is past finding out. But thank you, O oh God, on this day that I can live a life that's not in vain, but I can live a life for your purpose, for your will, for your glory, because you had to die in order for me and others, because he's going to justify many, many, many through all the ages that are set until you decide time will be no more. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen.